graders did not introduce ourselves uh, yesterday. Um, <laughs> my name is Erica Groh. I'm a meteorologist from the United States, though that's probably pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I do serve on the Council for the American Meteorological Society. This is my first uh, kind of uh, delving into uh, WMO activities, and I'm thrilled to be here and very excited for day two of our um, discussion on the launch of the OCP. My name is Tomas Molina. I'm chief meteorologist at Television of Catalonia, and also I use former chairman of IABM, is the International Association of Broadcast Meteorologists, with a status of observer uh, here at WMO. Our chair is Jay Trabak, uh, and thank you also for for being part of this uh, open platform and this uh, debate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, let's start again the second day of this second roundtable, and we will start with this with the summary of uh, what we did yesterday. So we invite Gerald Fleming, the chair of the Public, Public Weather Services at WMO. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Thomas, and, and good afternoon to everybody. So trying to summarize the many, many valuable contributions that we listened to yesterday and taking the first theme, uh, data and more shared data, and we have here the contributors. Contributors emphasized that while the expectation was for much more data to become available, there was also a need to emphasize high quality data. And the impact of that data on improving services was critical. And this can only be achieved with more high quality data, as well as devising means to exploit the lower quality data of which there will be vast amounts coming on stream. Investment in new technologies will be required to help this, but that's going to need uh, quite a lot of investment from both public and private sector. Data rights are clearly an issue. If possible, we need to find some sort of economic model that will promote the free and unrestricted availability of data, respect national sovereignty, and still allow some commercialization of data for private sector providers. And in particular, the global NWP centers, they need to be able to access high quality data sets, the same high quality data sets, to stimulate the continued development and competitive improvement in the NWP modeling but there'll be a greater diversity of data needed as well because it's not just the back end, if you like, the NWP, but the front end delivery systems will require different sorts of data. So there's a broadening of the number of sources that we're going to have to look to. The EU we listen to uh, that promotes free and unrestricted use of environmental data and it also creates a legislative framework for, if you like, regulating that uh, area of competition between public and private sector through frameworks. WMO Resolution 40 was mentioned a few times. It's seen as a great strength, but it's also seen that it was decided two and a half decades ago. Time has moved on, technology has moved on, so perhaps we need to look at certainly the annex of that and see is it still appropriate in the current circumstance. Moving on then to forecasting and forecasters, we heard that Earth system models are developing in complexity, incorporating more data sets for diverse elements of the ecosystem. There's now a need for those observations from many more sources. Now, while considerations of uncertainty do mean that we'll never have a perfect forecast, the challenges are to improve the parameterization and the model physics. The parameterization difficulties will largely disappear or at least be lessened as we reduce the model grid size down to about one kilometer. But uh, that's becoming feasible now with affordable exascale computing. Better assimilation of satellite data at these smaller grid scales will be a critical step but then there's going to be a growing volume of NWP data and getting that out to the users and particularly in the uh, developing world is going to be an issue because of the speed of data links that would be required. Now, many of the private sector providers are running their own NWP model suites, but they all acknowledge that they're still very heavily dependent on the public sector to support model development. Better models will need public and private to work together in that continued development. Artificial intelligence will certainly contribute value, especially in helping to provide more precision in local forecasting. But these developments will need collaborative work between public and private sector. The public sector needs to be strong, and political and economic decision makers do need to understand this. Forecasters and weather broadcasters will continue to play a very important role in the value chain, especially during periods of high impact weather. But the job is changing. Some of the older skills are becoming redundant, but some newer skills are now required. So while AI will become stronger, that human intelligence is still going to be a critical part of the system. Forecasters are going to be busy for a long time yet. But a strong partnership with academia is required to drive a paradigm shift in forecaster training 
that has to respect some newly developed didactic approaches focusing on competencies, and we need partnerships also between public, private and academic sectors to foster innovation in end products and services. The challenge that we all face is communicating more precise weather information down to lower and lower scales individual communities. That brings us on to the services and the vision for successful weather and climate services that every user should be able to receive the information as they need it and when they need it. The societal demands for meteorological information are increasing, that's partly because of climate change, but also the increasing complexity of society itself. So convenience of access and availability is a major aspect. We're going to need that partnership between public and private to achieve this vision. The public sector again providing the foundation, the private sector bringing a lot of innovation. For this to succeed, we're going to need better clarity of roles between the two sides. This is going to vary from region to region, from country to country, because of differences in culture, in legislative frameworks, and so on. And while better and more comprehensive data sets will be required, greater understanding and knowledge will be critical in transforming this improved data into improved services. Again, academia are going to be relied upon to facilitate the transfer of knowledge from academia into services in helping us to achieve that. Now, while WMO is largely organized around members as nations, there are many other actors that we heard, municipalities, towns, communities, at other levels, if you like, of granularity, that are still important in terms of decision making. And these people, many of them still not availing of the best scientific advice which is out there. So there's a, a job to do in reaching out to these decision makers and helping them and providing them with the scientific and technical support in the very important decisions that they make. This is all towards trying to achieve the sustainable development goals and we were reminded that the time between now and 2030 is really, really very short. The priority for all of us is protection of life and property and the public sector obviously needs to retain a very forward low role in, in warnings and so on. But beyond that, the benchmark is how better can we serve society, recalling that forecasts and warnings have no intrinsic value in themselves. The value only comes when they're actually put to use in making decisions. So that's a summary of the discussion. We also had some email contributions and many thanks to those who brought the email. So, so if we could just go to the next slide, uh, just in terms of uh, many contributions, but summarized as our world of data is changing radically, a far greater role for private enterprise as data providers, and a great growth in crowdsourced data. Moving on email contributions emphasized greater societal consequences and impacts of weather, climate, water, and environmental events and associated information and services. Social demand of improved services is largely underestimated as yet. And the point of this group is to foster mutual understanding and trust as an enabler, a frontier to successful practices. That's our summary of day one, and we look forward to day two. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. And uh, a reminder about today, we are here to talk about capacity um, and the capacity gap and roles and responsibilities. That will be the two themes that we're covering today. And uh, just a quick re a reminder, yesterday, everyone's comments were so uh, succinct and concise and very poignant and helpful. Uh, we would like to make sure that we stay on time so that we have a good uh, chunk of time at the end of today's session to talk about the joint statement. Uh, so we greatly appreciate that today's speakers will be able to stick to that uh, format of the mini panel with each theme. Uh, and again, we will have a brief summary, followed by a general summary for the day, and then we will move on to talk about the joint statement and the way moving forward. One last note before we get started with theme four, you may see a couple uh, empty seats around the table. Of course, World Congress is taking place, sessions are in effect right now, and uh, the people who were not able to make it today for day two uh, send their sincere regrets, uh, but we will have a very uh, lively and productive discussion today, no doubt. And then, well, yesterday, we, uh, Gerald has told us that we are talking about data, forecasting, demand and supply of services, and the two themes for today are this one, capacity gap, and also roles and responsibilities. And uh, Erica has said that we'll have to keep in time, so we have that, that idea of the elevator pitch role, but you were very good yesterday, so let's keep 
the same way uh, today. Uh, we, we start with this, uh, with the next one, which is this one, capacity gap, elevating inequality, and advancing, and advancing together. Um, during the, the previous survey uh, it was done, there was two, on your contribution, there were two scenarios. There was one optimistic scenario, that saying that in 2030, the capacity gap uh, between the developing and, uh, and, develop and developing countries uh, has increased. And, and the forecasts supporting the fundamental protection of life and property are available worldwide. And there is also a pessimistic uh, view that uh, the loss of application of indigenous knowledge due to selective globalization may maintain disproportional access to resources and technology. Uh, this was the two points made at the previous survey. And uh, the first person we'd like to ask for comment is Vladimir Tsirkonov uh, of the World Bank. Uh, when it comes to the capacity gap, the first thing that comes to mind is development funding. Um, how do we overcome the lack of long-term and coordinated grant funding, uh, reliable funding resources to support bridging that capacity gap in developing countries? Thank you and good afternoon. I will try to stay within these two minutes, but before Doing that, I wanted, to <laughs> before responding to this question, I wanted to acknowledge our gratitude to WMO and to Professor Petri Talas for acknowledging our role as one of the leading developing partners in bridging this capacity gap. Our vice president, who will be here on, on Monday and will participate in this developing partner segment, will reiterate our strong commitment to work with WMO, NMHS, private sector, academia, and all developing partners to improve hydromet service delivery in the developing countries. And now let me share a few thoughts about this capacity gap. It can be unending, but I will concentrate on the few ones and start with something which in my view may be not that traditional, and, and that is that is not very important issue. It is important, but not the, the most important one. The most important, in my view, is that the lack of government commitments. It's still, in the most developing countries, by far the most important issue which we should address as, uh, as a family. And we should do a better job explaining to the as high a level of the government as we can reach that this is a very critical sector for reaching sustainable economic development. And this is particularly easy to do now when all know mm -hmm. that Climate change is indeed a very serious threat to the whole humanity. Another issue which is also very serious is an efficient use of existing funds. We see again and again that those funds which are available, be it lending or be it uh, grant funding, uh, is not very efficient. And one of the main issue that we, from our client countries, uh, we see requests to build primarily infrastructure. First things which we hear, more AWS, more Doppler radar, uh, more supercomputers. And when we're trying to match existing budget and capacity with these high-tech instruments, it is clear that there is no way it can be sustainable. But still, we being trying to respond to the client needs, trying to match it, and therefore we often, and partly uh, our institution, one of those which is exceeding the amount of required infrastructure which can be sustainable and therefore it leads to unsustainable developments. I hope that together we can better convince our clients that there are different ways to reach sustainability. For instance, yesterday we uh, put on display our publication, recent publication from our book which was over there and there are some cases uh, to demonstrate how this can be reached. And finally, to, to conclude my more than two minutes, I believe uh, I'm convinced that availability of dedicated long-term grant funding is indeed also important. And uh, to do it right, uh, we should show and concentrate that grant funding on, on the issues which has significant global public goods value, like up air or like mm, Professor Palmer yesterday mentioned, the very high resolution uh, global forecasting. That would be things which would be first priorities and for that I hope again as a joint family we can convince a uh, granting facility like GCF to contribute resources which will benefit all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we are now in, the, in this capacity gap so we have big bodies like the World Bank and our next speaker is Albert Matisse, uh, permanent representative of Curaçao and St. Martins. 
and he's from a small national uh, weather service. Uh, how do you consider your capacity level and, and your equipment techn technically, financially, and with human resource, uh, if you can prioritize, what will be the number one priority in small? Uh, thank you, and uh, um, what I would like to say is actually, um, first of all, yesterday we have heard a lot of uh, good ideas uh, working in the future, what they would like to do, but I will say, let's start with the quick wins. Let's find a way to get the low-hanging fruits before thinking in the future. Because right now, we all see that there is several ways that are by no means or by very low efforts, we will be able to uh, help our clients. Our clients are asking for the forecast from that we have right now. They're not asking that maybe in the future we'll have a resolution of one minute model or one meter model they would like to ask the forecast from now. So coming from a um, meteorological organization, that is where we're looking right now. Get the, the fast track and start getting the quick wins. The quick wins lies already. I think everyone, when they wake up this morning, they got a forecast from a private company or from an agency this morning. So it's already there but we have to make it in a shape, in a way that it will be helpful to everyone. So I would like to say something about uh, the human resource management, because there it starts. You can invest in a country, millions, but you don't have the right people on the right seats. You will not be able to sustain the development in a country, in a med service. That's why it goes hand in hand if you want to have a sustainable project in one country, you have to be sure to get the people the capacity they need. We start with the uh, research of uh, the human part of it. The second part is actually, we envision actually already, we are talking about uh, um, engines that will provide forecasts. They are already there. So right now, actually, if you take a look at the forecaster's job, it will be a guidance forecast. It will make use of his knowledge to evaluate several models that are available right now, and then from there, it will say, okay, for today, I will use this type of model, and from there, it, the engine will be able to transfer the data, model data, into text, into voice. That's easy thing to do. Secondly, actually, we're talking about um, uh, warnings for decision making. That's something else. That is also, again, something that you need supervisors because models will be able, or radar data will be able to produce warnings. Also with the text available to push that. But only what you will need as a med service is someone to push the red button. So that's also important. And then after that, the, the med service will find a way or has to look for a consultant because briefing will be very important. You have to have human interaction with your clients and that is something you need to do. So I think uh, by looking this is actually the change. We have to find a way to make use of the existing capacity that we have already, not at national level only, but also internationally. So by, do, by saying that, I think let's start for first with the quick wins. Let's work together because there are four areas that we have to work together. Observation is one, then the production of the forecast, and then the dissemination part. That is where we have to first work as a public-private enterprise, and from there we will look what the future will bring us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, um, I would like to invite Jime uh, uh, Adum, Jime uh, Adum, uh, the Executive Secretary for SEALS, to speak. Um, your organization operates in a region with uh, the biggest capacity issues and, at the same time, uh, great vulnerability to weather, water, and climate hazards. 
Uh, could you share your experience in capacity development uh, and public-private partnership, please? Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. For the last 30 years, Hilson, its uh, agri-med center has been playing the technical role in uh, providing the uh, region under the leadership of ECOWAS and UMOA and the, uh, our funding partners uh, establishing this 30-year-old uh, network we call the RPCA, the Food Crisis and Prevention Network. And basically what, it, and, and how specifically what SILS does in this process is that we organize seasonal climate outlooks, bringing everybody at the table uh, and discussing more or less what does the season look like and provide that information uh, for producers and, and key policy and decision makers. Connected with that, we provide information. We use radios and phone companies to package and disseminate that information uh, to end users. And we establish relational databases to collect uh, field and satellite uh, resources on climate, water, ag, crops, and pest diseases, socioeconomics, and nutrition and market. And we are in the process of establishing uh, AgriMed as the uh, climatic regional center to service uh, Sahel and West Africa to scale up some of those uh, uh, experiences we've been generating. And the RPCA model has been very successful in preventing uh, crisis and, and uh, uh, weather-related outbreaks, uh, bringing us together annually, biannually to for the whole world to see what the region has been capable of doing. And naturally, we have not been able to avoid all disasters, but this network has been extremely extremely helpful and in that process too we develop and uh, reinforce institutional capacities for institutions, NGOs, uh, member states and what have you. And uh, I want to take the opportunity to you know, thank the uh, launching of this uh, platform because this will certainly allow us to uh, bring to uh, fruition the various experiences and then scale up uh, multi-purpose systems mm -hmm. so that we can change the landscape and build a transparent and effective partnership with the CSOs and private sector for better livelihood and sustained uh, well-being. And then uh, business as usual, as you know, is not going to be uh, good enough because we are facing uh, some food sh short shortages. And if you look at some of the literature in Africa, the trends have been going somewhat downward, particularly with respect to food uh, uh, nutrition uh, and well-being. And so uh, SILS is going to play its part and the uh, partners who have the experience and we need to scale up and our funders, uh, among which uh, here are present the World Bank, USAID, the African Development Bank, European Union, uh, Suicide and what have you, and, uh, IFD and so on, are really quite uh, busy and I think they're looking forward to uh, this opportunity and uh, upgrading data systems and uh, upgrading uh, skills for those who are in the uh, member state, at least those who belong to the ECOWAS, EOMI, and SILS region is going to be of paramount importance to be able to you know, get our hands around this uh, mammoth uh, uh, challenge and, and, and hit the ball out of the park. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Adoum. Next speaker will be Patrick Benichou from uh, Meteo France International. Uh, your company, uh, has been involved in the capacity development for a long time. Can you say that there are significant new trends nowadays that uh, would bring rapid and tangible improvement in the future? Yes, thank you. Uh, Meteo France International is, a, as you say, is a unique private entity specialized in the design and implementation of integrated modernization project, and this is what we are doing since uh, 2002, which is quite a, quite a bit. So we get some uh, experience on this. I would say that uh, looking at today, uh, the, the landscape is uh, has a lot of contrast. There are threats and opportunities. As a matter of fact, despite stronger and stronger expectation for more tailored weather and climate services, I would give a very realistic and maybe pessimistic statement. Uh, I think that the future of many national med services is at stake. It is at stake if they do nothing. And uh, they, they feel under the threat of private sector, they need to define how best implement the med value chain in the form of a digital workflow. And this med value chain is getting wider and wider every year. So it's, a, it's really a challenge. And this is, they, they have to do this locally with limited means. For many of them, 
they still have to switch to user-oriented bodies and to digitization process. So in short, they are at a critical step of their existence and they need, in, in my mind, they need to rethink their strategy and business model with one single goal, be a key player in their country and help contribute to the socio-economic development. So there are ways to, to face the challenge, as you kindly asked me. The, the, the public sector, including the, the national med services, cannot embrace everything from the, the, this value chain. So they need to set priorities and define on which activities they will focus their investment and stuff. To make it short, they have been investing or focusing a lot on observation. This is still needed, but now they need to invest in information technology and service delivery. They may, in parallel, for, for achieving this goal, they may, they may engage with partners. Why not from private sector? including locally, because transfer of knowledge is very essential in this and we should transfer of knowledge to the countries, to help optimize, achieve, sustain the implementation of the national value chain in a systematic and sustainable way while keeping sovereignty on their core duties, of course. So this is quite a challenge and we, we know exactly how to do that. Yeah. There is also another topic which is service capacity. So they may engage with private sector, I mean the med services, they may engage with private sector as well on this topic to dramatically increase the amount and the quality of the weather and climate services and meet the expectation of the market or of the users. They may not be market, but they are expectation in any case and ensure appropriate dissemination towards more and more demanding users of all kinds. So in my mind, there are the, the partnership and the PPE that you can imagine, PPE arrangement, should and can be seen as boosters to the development of the national med services role and activity in the country. So in this kind, in this way, PPE may help the national med service grow and satisfy the growing country expectation. And last, I would say that we need a proper business model for that. It should be sought and tuned on a case-by-case ca case basis. There is no universal truth for that, but there is a clear win-win objective for that, to make PPE successful and sustainable over time. Last, last comment for the World Bank and development partners. The compatibility of this PPE approach, which we think is successful, with the current development partners' practice shall be sought more systematically. It is not the case yet, but we are ready to work on this. Thank you. Right, thank you, sir. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, I know that we have so much to contribute here. Uh, we are running long on time already, um, so I would encourage you to please try to keep your comments succinct and short, and again, we have a website, ppe at wmo.int, where you can share your further comments and commentary. It will all be ingested and accepted and uh, uh, used as a part of the, uh, the joint statement. Uh, but next, I would like to invite Pauline Dubé uh, from University of Botswana to speak. Uh, as a researcher in a developing country, what are the specific challenges and how do you see your role in helping to uh, address the capacity gap? Thank you, and um, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to come here. I think as an academic, I, I found that I have a lot of latitude to operate, and I've used that, which is the academic freedom, basically, to create a, a vertical movement of information from the international to the local region, and also to have the horizontal part within the nation to make sure that that information uh, can filter into the grassroots level. I basically spent may maybe 30 years of my time doing that, which means sacrificing my academic excellency in terms of publishing. But uh, one of the things that occurred to us as early as in the early 1990s when we uh, got away of uh, you know, global change, climate change, is that these are cross-cutting issues and you cannot uh, you know, have the natural sciences handle them. So already we set up structures. We had a, a, what we call the Botswana Climate Change Committee 
uh, which, which basically uh, uh, involve both the natural and the social science, you know, multidisciplinary, but moved beyond that, engaged the government in that committee, engaged the NGOs, engaged the private sector, to an extent that the, the decision to have a, a Botswana climate change policy was actually made at, a, a, at, a, at the Botswana a, a commerce a, a, a organization, you know, the private sector annual meetings that they hold, rather than from a natural science kind of thing. And we have moved to, to take that further, I mean, we have partnered with the, 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 the meteorology department, as we did all that, and we moved that beyond to take it to the region we set up the Southern Africa Fire Network, which originally was just a, uh, for validating satellite data, and moved that to, to bring in the issues of climate e into that aspect, and also bring the policy aspect and the communities in that kind of thing. Basically, uh, what I'm really saying is that the integration is, is very important, and you integrate by identifying the value of the climate, weather, water issues, and then getting the stakeholders that are dealing with that to bring them in. But the other thing that is really important to do is to stay alert and be ready. When the optimum time to communicate the information comes, you have to be ready to do that. So before coming here, I had to be in Johannesburg with the SADC Parliamentary Committee because they wanted to know about the tropical iodide, you know, the cyclone. And that was a great opportunity for me now to go and communicate to them the issues of climate, which you wouldn't do under normal conditions. Other good things that I've seen happen is to have people in the medical you know, field inviting me to join them because they wanted to look at climate, the role of climate in non-communicable diseases, something that I, before it didn't, you know, was not the case. So we are making progress in, that er in these areas of closing the gap, but the gap we are dealing with is huge. It's a gap that is related with a bigger system where you know, prosperity in one region usually means you know, vulnerability in another region. So it cannot be a WMO alone and it cannot be an individual, but there is room for us as individuals to contribute in that area. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next speaker will be Ofa Fa Anunu, a permanent representative of Tonga with WMO and a small island state in the Pacific. Do you see a potential for public-private academy collaboration in improving the capacity in your service and servicing better your country? Thank you. Um, I'd like to start with a small story. I remember my first Congress. This was in 2003. I came, I came here to Geneva with uh, the Prime Minister of Tonga. He is now the King of Tonga. And uh, we were going through the agenda items, uh, and we came to, to polar regions and mountain areas, I think, or something like that. And he asked me, why are we not in this uh, activity? And I was sitting there wondering, why would we be in the polar? <laughs> <laughs> and then he laid down and said, so you believe all of these climate change things come from the melting of the ice and all of these things? Yeah, that's what the scientists said. Yeah, yeah so you have to be involved in this thing. And uh, it, it's taken me a number of years since that day to to think about it and, and to finally realize that what he actually meant was to be here at this table. That we have to be involved to be able to, to form the partnerships that, uh, that uh, we need uh, to, to, to advance the, the, the small island states. It's, it's clear what the small island states' uh, needs are. Uh, but the mechanism, first of all, I'd like to agree with uh, what Vladimir was said, was having that uh, support at the top level is very, very important. And then you have to be the best at your trade, like what Patrick said. You have to have your service delivery spot on. In the, in the, in the Pacific Island, small island states, traditional knowledge was for a long time we sail around the Pacific for many, many years. And traditional knowledge was the basis. Once upon a time, the med service was like uh, everybody will make fun of the med service when they come on, uh, come on air and say something. Oh, these are the jokers that are uh, wasting the money of the government. That, uh, 
But eventually, as we went through, climate change had a big help in bringing the fund, funds in. And we developed with the help of WMO and everybody here at this table, forming the partnerships. Now we are one of the, I would say, leading agencies in, in, uh, in our country. We have the Ministry of Meteorology, D Disaster Management, blah, blah, blah. And we have, there's a lot of opportunities and I look forward for this uh, climate, uh, for, for this uh, country support initiative. We have problems like lack of legislation. Uh, our economy is small. Lack of understanding on, on how to build uh, partnerships. There's a lot of training that's, that's needed uh, for, for small island states. But I, uh, being there in the room and, and talking the issues, getting the support of your government, but most importantly, your users, you'll get there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Dion Turblanc to speak, a special science advisor to the South African Weather Service. Uh, you wrote about uh, the need for global and regional, regional partnership to address critical issues, the growing gap between developed and developing countries, special attention to cities, oceans, and water. Uh, can the uh, OCP uh, help facilitate uh, bridging those gaps? Thank you very much, and good afternoon, colleagues. It's quite interesting that a group of people like similar to us around this table probably caused many of the problems highlighted in the latest global risk report in the last 200 years. It's a group of people, engineers, innovators, business people, scientists, uh, mostly consisting of men. And so that brings us to the uh, first point in the capacity gap, because we are probably only tapping into half the intellectual capacity that we can tap into. So I think that needs to be addressed. But furthermore, I think we should think about the capacity development issue in a fairly broad context. And the assumption that uh, all the global centers has all the capacity that they need to uh, take advantage of the latest emerging computer technology down to the needs of the developing country and the least developed country needs to get the message out and to get the basic things right there's a capacity gap throughout the value chain. And I think we need to realize that, that we need to have a balanced funding model to, uh, to address the biggest challenge that we are probably facing in the 21st century. So this challenge is so big that I think that the uh, partnership agreements that we need to have and the models of service delivery should now become much more formal than they were in the past. We, uh, we've got good lessons from the past as well that we shouldn't ignore. The lessons learned from Thorpex, which was a research experiment run by WMO, where we used uh, multi-model ground ensembles, where everybody contributed, and where you can then if actually have a more objective view of the contributions of everybody and enhance the products and the uncertainty associated with the forecast at different time ranges. So we shouldn't forget those lessons. And maybe those models can create the framework of how we can, in a technical way, uh, work together between academia and the public and private sector even in the future. We have the emerging seamless uh, global data processing and forecasting system that builds on that. And we have very nice initiatives like the uh, severe weather forecast demonstration products, projects that uh, give us a a framework in which it's clear that everybody doesn't have to do the same things, but we each need to do what we best do at the different levels to fill the capacity gaps. The Earth system approach and the seamless nature of the new strategy of the WMO creates many opportunities for us to serve society better. So in closing, I would uh, recommend that we really look at the critical issues, and those are related to data and product exchange between all of us. We have policies that need improvement, but we don't have the technologies that allow us to support those policies. These technologies could be related to new initiatives like blockchain, but it's actually a tap and it's counterintuitive. It gives control to data owners to open a tap. So it's much better than a switch because normally if you have a switch, it's either on or off and we know that it's mostly off these days. But if you have a tap, you can systematically open it in a controlled way as you build confidence and trust. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Treblanche. And now we have the, we pass the, the floor to Michel Jean, uh, Michel Jean, President of the Commission of <coughs> Basic Science. As a president of a very important commission, how do you see the role of alleviating inequalities? Your so thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'll try, I'll try to be very brief, because some of the points have been raised by colleagues around the table, but I, I, will, I will make reference to those. Uh, I'll just start with a bit of a, uh, of a harsh statement. I mean, world meteorological centers right now are generating collectively probably 10 petabytes of information, of data per day. And I would argue that over 150 countries around the world are either having no access or a very small access to uh, that incredibly rich, uh, we've never had so much information about the Earth systems that we have nowadays. So, uh, so I'll start with that. So gaps are along three fronts, technology, governance, and paradigm shift, uh, and people. On the technology, it's all about making the data available in a way that is usable for, uh, for, for colleagues around the world. It's about establishing regional, huge, huge regional digital platform uh, and, uh, and smart you know, AI-driven tools. Uh, I'll call that data extractor, for lack of a better word, that, that allow to use the information that you need when you need it for the purpose that you need it. In terms of governance and paradigm shift, uh, governance, uh, one of the way to, to fit, to fix some of the gaps, uh, the, the global weather enterprise uh, with under the leadership of the World Bank and now the WMO ex exercising the leadership with the establishment of the op this open platform. I think governance is extremely important. Uh, to find a way collectively to work better together. So what I have said in terms of technology ain't gonna happen only with government institution. And in fact, uh, the role of the private sector is essential. Paradigm shift, Patrick Benichoux has alluded to it, but I think it's extremely important. Uh, we will, in order to fix that gap, there will need to be a fundamental paradigm shift in, in many, many, many of the NMHSs around the world. So rather than to try to catch up, there will need to be a jump into the future, and we will need to enable that. And final point around the people, uh, gender equity is extremely important. Around the table, there are six women and 25 men. Mm -hmm. And I fully support uh, my colleague Dion that we just cannot afford to not uh, make use of, uh, of that huge pool of talent that, that we have. And on the people as well, we will need to rethink completely the approach to training and competency development because the weather services in 10 years from now will not look at all at what they look today. So thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Bob Ridaway to speak, uh, president of EMS. Uh, actually, I have two short questions. How uh, education and training will evolve in the effort to reduce the capacity gap, and also, what is the role of the meteorological societies in that uh, public-private academic partnership? Right, it, it's easier to deal with the first question, uh, I think. The education and training program, WMO, has been aiming to close this capacity gap. That's what it's, it's there for. And it's been doing lots of things over the years, and it's had some impact. But the gap is still very large. There's so something new needs to happen. And I think there's reasons to be optimistic, because a few years ago, it was decided to create what was called the WMO Global Campus, which is going to be a way of encouraging people to share resources, to collaborate. And uh, that has been started as a demonstration project. I hope it's going to be funded. It started off really concentrating on the regional MET training centres uh, and also the, uh, the training centres from National MET services. <coughs> also, once encompassed universities, that actually becomes more difficult because there's a lot of them. And how do you engage with the, the universities in contributing to the global campus? And the same play applies to the private sector. Uh, also, it was envisaged that they also would contribute to and benefit from the, the global campus. So I think there's reason to be optimistic that if that happens and if it continues to be funded, then there's going to be a mechanism for closing this capacity gap. 
But just doing that isn't going to be sufficient if you think about the, the jobs of the future, such as people who are now you know, broadcasters. Uh, in 10 years' time, I think there are mainly going to be meteorological consultants. They're going to be helping their customers make decisions. Uh, and that's going to require a different kind of, a different set of skills. Uh, they're going to, so things like communication skills are going to be very important, team working, influencing. And so one of the challenges is going to be how do you support uh, the services in developing that kind of workforce that has those soft skills and is committed to continuous improvement and, and self-learning. But even that isn't sufficient. Uh, because the key to actually making changes and developing the workforce is to have line managers who don't just see their role as, as command control, uh, deciding, or sort of planning resources and deciding how they're going to be used. It's getting a culture change within organizations whereby line managers see their role as one of motivating and developing and coaching the, the people. But it's only in that way that they're going to be able to cope with this ever-changing environment. Uh, with regards to the second question, I can be very brief on that. Uh, you ask what role can meteorological societies play? And I think, honestly, it's very, very little in closing this capacity gap. Uh, what they can do, though, uh, is, is not close this capacity gap, I think. Uh, but what they, they do already is that they encompass the, uh, the, the public sector, uh, academia, academia uh, and, and the private sector. So already they work together. It's a, a natural part of the, the work of the, the meteorological societies. And so I think the meteorological societies can be used to sort of spread the word and the ideas which is coming about to do with the, the global campus. I think you can use the, the meteorological society to, to spread the word about what is happening in this area. Thank you very much, Mr. Ridaway.